tonight I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about love. Love makes the world go around. I feel it in, I feel it in my fingers. I feel it in my toes. Lekker. I heard Indrach did well with your Sari yesterday. Well done. Lekker. But our world is a crazy, crazy world. And you can just show the next slide. Thank you, Michael. It's just a crazy world. Uh, I mean, people build buildings, the Taj Mahal, because of love. Love moves the world. It makes the world go around. People go to war because they loved Helen of Troy. <laughs> and we write about those wars. People do crazy things for love. I remember I bought a violin while I was a student because I wanted to impress girls. So I bought a violin... And I was literally on Helswichter's roof. I was the fiddler on the roof. I used to practice in my res. All I wanted to do with the violin was impress the girls. And I did. I did. I could only play two tunes. Uh, let me tell you why. I put down the violin. So I prayed. I went to the conserve. I met a few girls who taught me violin there. And I was playing, you know, a few tunes on the violin. And I went home. And my brother Garth is musically gifted, so he picked up the violin. By that time, I was playing for a month and a bit, so I can do it. Nah, 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 nah. So I can do the things, and eventually I picked it up and I played. And I gave it to him, and he goes like, oh, this is a cool thing. Literally three minutes later, he started playing a tune. So I put down the violin. I said, no, this is, this is offensive. It's intimidating. <laughs> But I did sat a few times with the violin, me and my friends in Elswichter, and uh, we, did, we did well. We, we got a few applauds, and uh, we got a few dates because of that. But, but love makes you do crazy things. The desire for love makes you do crazy, crazy things. Um, we're going to look at a music clip now. But let me just say that if you desire to have a happily married life, if you desire someone to share life with, First of all, it's a godly thing. Second of all, I want to say it is 95% of young adults, adults surveyed in the Northwest Coast in America, big survey, um, recently, 95%, the number one thing people desire in life more than anything else is to share life in peace and in harmony and with love with one other person. It's the greatest desire that anyone has. It's really a desire. So we do crazy things because of love. But I want to say that when we talk about love and when we talk about relationships tonight, obviously the right place to start doing it is to start looking in the Bible. But I just want you to be aware that when you talk about seeking someone, dating, love, if you talk about these things, that we are so influenced by the world around us. Massively, massively. Every song that you listen to, Every movie, every book, every play we go to. I don't know if you guys do plays, but every play we go to. I mean, it educates us and it sets a precedent for what we desire about love and relationships. So there are quite a number of myths. Maybe we can just jump to that slide of myths, please, Michael. A number of myths that, um, that go around. And I'm, not, I'm saying this based on, on research, so I'm not just saying this lightly. That there are so many myths that um, some of you are laughing, so let me just tell you the joke. You've all seen these little chocolate, chocolate men. So it says, some of you can't read that, but it says this. It says, listen, this is the perfect man. He's rich, he's handsome, he's very dark. And if I get tired of him, I can bite his head off. <laughs> Jason, you see that? No, no, no. <laughs> But that's, the, that's a joke. I just before I start, I want to say that I recognize that relationships talks are humorous and funny when you're 18, perhaps when you're 22, perhaps when you're 25. It's not always that funny when you're 35 and you're still waiting around. So I just want to say that I recognize that. Some are laughing. I actually mean this seriously. It's fine if you laugh now. It means that you're 20. But it really, it really is not so funny when you're 35 anymore. And the number one reason many researchers believe, and biblically why I believe, that many people don't find a partner, someone to share life with, is because of the wrong expectations. And the number one reason why there are so many divorces in the world is because our assumptions and what these songs teach us about love and relationships, it's a wrong assumption. It's not a biblical thing. God, God designed marriage to be one thing, 
And so if you have other assumptions, other expectations, and other applications, you're going you're gonna to miss it somewhere, and, and you're going to be the one that's hurt because of that. So let me just go through some assumptions and things, and then we'll delve into Scripture. I just want to just play a bit of myth busters here and just blow these relational myths out of the way. You can laugh with me, and then we'll be serious after that. The first one is the assumption that, and we hear this in church circles, and I want to say that it's wrong. We only, let me just jump to the next slide, that all I need is Jesus, and I'll be happy. And I've heard so many times people say this in church circles to someone who cries at night because she really wants a husband, or someone who, who longs to have a wife. He really, he really longs to have a wife. He doesn't want a girlfriend. He doesn't want a plaything. He wants a wife. He wants someone that's semi like his mother, you know, someone he can share life with. Hey, that's true. We either want someone to be like our parent or we really don't want someone to be like our parents. So it's either that we either run into that. But the number one reason that we read in the Bible about marriage, the first thing we read is God introduces the thought. And I think Sia shared this last week. God introduced this thought. And God said, he looked at Adam, he made him, he was perfect, he was handsome, he was 40 years old like me, he was a strong ox, this is a machine. And God looked at that dude, he was doing CrossFit in the garden, I had a beard, I had a real beard like the guys today. And he was looking at him and he said, everything's perfect, but this boy needs help. Literally, God says, this boy needs help. This boy's not going to do it alone. God said it's not good for Adam to be alone. God was the one that said it's not good for him to be alone. I'll make him a helper. And so many times in marital courses and, you know, popular Christianity, people blow that helper theme of the wife out of place. You know, like the man is the man and the woman is like the helper, you know. But the definition is quite clear here. It's not so difficult. It's quite clear here. God said... It's not good to be alone. I will make you someone to help you. With what? The loneliness. That's it. Marriage, per definition, is companionship. It's a covenant of companionship. God said, it's not good for you to be alone. I'll give you someone to help you out of your loneliness. The number one reason why people cry at night is because I want someone to share life with. I want the companionship. I want the comrade. I want someone to share my life with. I went to Florida quite soon after I was married. We just planted the church in Pretoria. I was still working in the Air Force. I had to go in a course. And whenever I think about someone to share life with, those are the images they had. So in those days, we didn't have many electronic media. We did have some. And I remember, <laughs> I remember so I'm going with the Air Force, and I'm in Florida, America. I mean, that's flippin' awesome. And I've got a few moments between the Air Force maintenance course that I went to, you know, the hotel to, to go to a, a theme park. I, I couldn't go to Disney because my time was too short. So I had to go to another theme park. So I go to an African theme park. I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> so they, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> the roller coasters were cool, but the African animals, I'm like, I've seen this, really, we do this. Anyway. But remember setting on the timer of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the camera the whole time. So I go and I set the 30 second camera and I put the pose there and I go and I pose. <laughs> and I set a camera and I run and I go and pose and I point to something. You know, I wanted to share, I want my wife to be with me. I wanted Magritte to share that moment. And I think sometimes we go through life and you just want someone just to, this is really cool, eh? Hey, it's like, yes, and all this by lacquer of this stupid, of Kekiri Snaks at Willyfant, you know, something like that. And Adam had no one to say Kekiri Snaks at Elephant. And God said, yes, you're right, Adam. Everything's perfect except this. So guys, if ever in your Christian fellowship, someone says, yeah, I'm really, really, you know, it will be good to get married now. Like, this is a good time to have someone. Just someone to hold. Don't say, all you need is Jesus. <laughs> because Jesus was the one who said to Adam, you need something else. Sinless, perfect garden, everything excellent, no sin, nothing wrong. God said, 
this boy needs help. I can't give it to him. He needs a wife. He needs someone to share life with. And the helper is only defined as the one who helps him take the loneliness away. I'm going to say it later, but you know what the promise of marriage is? This one line. A promise that I will never, ever make you feel alone again. That's your promise. I will be with you. Nothing more, nothing less. Great. So, the next thing, the lie <laughs> that we, we got there in the movie and the lie, I want to say this is the number one lie. 95% of people in one specific survey in America, this is what they believe. And I want to say this is all over the world. This is the Greek myth of the, sm- the soulmate. And people have Christianized this one big time. It's the Greek myth of the soulmate, which says that there is this one. Let me tell you the myth. So Zeus got really angry, according to Plato, who wrote this in his, in his one book, which I just forgot the title with. And he wrote this and he said, listen, so this is the origin story of life, the Greek myth, the Greek religion. And he said, listen, this is what happened. So the people on earth rebelled. But at those time, people had four legs. How many of you have seen that? Four legs, four arms, both genitalia. Everything was like amazing. The face of a man and a woman sort of merged. Like he was a retro, a retro, <laughs> retro Greek guy. Anyway, so it's amazing. And then it's, they rebelled again and they said, well, what should we do? The gods counseled one another and said, what should we do with these people? And they said, no, let's, uh, let's squash them like we did with the Titans, the clash of the Titans. Let's kill them like the Titans who rebelled against us. And the gods said... No, because then we're going to miss out on our payment, our worship. We want worship. We want tribute from them. So he said, we've got a good idea. Zeus said, let's split them in half, male and female, with the navel of a constant reminder that they were connected to someone. And let's send them on this earth to live in misery until they find their other half. This is a Greek philosophy, a Greek religion. I want to tell you that if there's one thing in every freaking movie on earth... And every book on earth, that's it. Find your other half. You know, they find one another and they say, you complete me. (laughs) I were incomplete until I found you. And so we, we make this Christian. So Christian people say, okay, I like that. Let's make this Christian. Let's say, God has your other half somewhere. And we laugh now. But that's the mindset of at least 95% of people that are not even religious. So us before we get saved. We believe that there is one person out there and the the whole thrust of this Platonic theory is saying that we will live in misery until I find that one person and then I will be satisfied. I feel whole. You complete me. I feel happy. I feel at peace now. And that's it. That is the, the, the lie. It says there's one person out there. Some of you go, but isn't that biblical? Doesn't God have one person for you? I'm like, there's one person in the Bible, in all of the Bible. The Bible writes about marriage and relationship from beginning to end. I mean, there's, every prophet spoke about it. The Psalms speak about it, sing about it, actually. Psalm 45, they sing about it beautifully. Song of Solomon is devoted to erotic love and sexual love in marriage. The whole book is about that. And the New Testament, every single letter and every one of Jesus', uh, every one of the Gospels teach about marriage. There is only one reference to who to marry in the Bible. There's only one instruction. Okay, we know that Paul said in two of these letters, two of places in Corinthians, he says, marry a Christian. That's it. So if there's someone with the name Christian or Christian here tonight, I want to say, <laughs> you marryable, dude. You are marryable right there, Okay. But I don't think that was the original intent. I don't think that was the original intent. Okay? There's only one other person in the Bible who had received a command from God to marry someone. Who is that? The only Mexican prophet in the Bible? Hosea. Hosea. Hosea is the only person who received a command to marry someone. And I want to say, if like in this story we just saw and you're about to marry a prostitute, then I'm going to say, you need a word from God for that one. But for the rest, you don't need a word from God. You don't need it. I want to to strongly encourage you guys. We pray and expect wrong 
if we want God to take us to the one person that he has destined us to marry. I want to say in Christian circles, that is the number one reason why people end up marrying really, really late. Really, really late. Because you believe that there's one person out there that you're going to find. And if you find this one person, do you know what's the fundamental belief in this, this, this religious statement of the Greeks? That the success and joy in marriage depends on who you marry. That is the thrust of the lie. I want to tell you there are a number of, I've been pastor now for 12 years, one number of people that have come to me and they're really, their marriages are shaky. Christian, pe Christian people have shaky marriages. Can you believe that? Anyway, so there was shaky marriage and then this, if this lie is in your head, then you go like, maybe I married the wrong one. Maybe I sinned against God by marrying this one. So let me fix it. Let me divorce this one and find the right one. You laugh. That is why Christians divorce. Because they believe they married the wrong one. So the assumption is, if I marry the right one, then my marriage will be successful and great. If I marry the wrong one, then God will be unhappy with me because I didn't do what God wanted me to do. Let me tell you, that is nonsense. The Bible says marry Christians. So if his name is Christian here tonight, then marry that guy. But it has a wider connection. It means marry a Christian. That's it. We marry a Christian. That's it. Choose someone to marry. And then you marry that one. Some of you are not believing me yet. Come to me when you're 40. That's just a bad grappie. It's a bad grappie. Spice knocks on my heart. Anyway, so the next one. So this is the big Greek one. The big Roman myth that we live with, you know this one, Cupid, every Valentine, this guy gets worshipped a lot, lots, lots, lots. We all eat his chocolates and stuff like that. But Cupid, the demigod, is a man, a small demigod, that has, has, is blessed with, a, you know, the poison-tipped arrows. So he doesn't really look like, like that. Originally, he didn't look like that. They just made him like that because he's a demigod, so it's cute if... So, but he was a he was a man man, and then he has this arrow. And if he shoots you, the first target, if the first person you look to, you will be you will fall under the spell of love. Crazy emotions will run over you, and you will do whatever you can to satisfy and to be with this person. Your whole world goes about. And I think all of us, most of us, maybe not the engineers, but most of us have felt that before. <laughs> you felt that feeling. You felt that feeling. <laughs> Grappy, bad grappy. You know, you've, you've felt that emotion of infatuation. It's actually called infatuation. The passion that burns on the inside for you just to, to be with that person. It's the reason why we, make, we write songs that we just listen to. It's the reason why people write poetry. It's the reason why people paint. It's the reason why people pick up violins to play outside races. We will do any, I will do anything for love except that. You know, meatloaf, I never know what meatloaf, that one thing is, but that's, anyway, everything else. That's what he says. We will do anything for that. But, and the belief is this, that if, if it feels right, it must be right. If, it feel, if I feel love, then this is of God. Isn't God love? So I, I feel this now of God. And I say, no, that's, that's just infatuation. That's just, the Bible refers to that as passion or lust. But, you know, I feel this thing. And, and isn't it true that the heart wants what the heart wants? You know, I can't, I can't deny my heart. I must obey my heart. I must obey my feelings. You know, and this is what people really believe. That in two ways, if I feel this, then I must pursue this. Guys, if you're going to go into a marriage covenant, I'm going to go to covenant now. If you're going to go into a marriage covenant for the rest of your life, you're going to need a little bit more than feelings. Feelings, all I have is feelings. You've got to have more than that. There's something more that you're going to need. Don't follow blind emotion. Love is blind. The feelings are blind. It's literally, you can't see. You can't think right. Because it's just a crazy flush of hormones and excitement right there. And you don't follow that. The second thing is, 
It has two sides. The one side is don't run after that. The other side that I want to say is don't wait for that. That's just dumb. That's just dumb. You want to wait for some demigod demon to shoot you in the butt with an arrow <laughs> before you commit to life? That's dumb. But I want to say, we're laughing now, but this is such a fundamental belief. Every movie, every book, every CD, everything that we have in life, every poem has this as its basis. You know, praise God, people are writing poetry about other things beside love now at the moment. But that's the fundamental belief. You think that unless I get shot, I must wait now. And I'm like, no. You pursue the godly design of marriage. We'll get to that now. A partner, companionship, life. Feelings come. Christian love is not void of feelings. I mean, just read through the Psalms. Just read through the prophets. Just read through Song of Solomon sober-mindedly. And you go like, whoa, too much information. There's real passion here. It's real passion here. I'm not going to go into that now. And then you read that, but don't just follow your heart. Don't just follow your heart. The Bible says we should restrain ourselves. We should restrain ourselves. And that's one thing that as a student, many times in my crying year in church was because of, because of that, because of the inability to restrain myself. The first thing the Bible teaches Christians when it comes to marriage, Corinthians, it says each man must learn to control his own passions. Just control it. But be here. Marry someone. Marry quickly. But, um, so Christian, you can my trouw van on. Anyway, like, niemand hoef iets vir jou te voel nie. Jy kan net trouw. Anyway. The next one I want to put out, and this is our society. This is us. This is a new thing. It didn't, wasn't, it didn't used to be like this, but this is a new thing. Oh, jy lad, dis nogal bad. So, the whole consumer, consumerist gamble thing. And I refer to consumers gamble because of this. Consumers, first of all, because of your Facebook and LinkedIn and whatever else profiles you have on your phone, you know, it's like, it's like Farmer Weekly, people buying cattle. I find that people date in the same way. It goes like, hmm, look at the specs. When we were young, we had these cards. I have to get to the Bible, so I'll move now. But when we were young, we used to have these cards, hey? That, that compares, you know, vliegtuigen or, you know, tanks or cars or boats. And you would compare them like that. And you'd see like this one has more kilowatt than that one. And this one's more torque and this one's more firepower. And we'd compare this stuff like that. People do this with one another. I don't want to say we do that. I'm married now, so I'm fine. But we do this with one another. We compare people, whether we do it online on an online dating site, which is, I want to say, in, er, inherently, it's not a bad thing. I just want to say, inherently, there's nothing bad about an online dating site. I have a few friends who actually got married, happily married, because at least they found someone, you know? It's like, but, yeah. Skis. <laughs> if you're in a big church with lots of prime specimen, the pool is larger. If you're in a small place and you work 10 hours a day, it's a bit difficult to find someone. So at least at night, safely, you can find someone to have a conversation with and maybe they're decent and maybe you marry them. Anyway, Mar, excuse me, we, we laugh now, but this is serious. We compare people as packages of meat, mostly in the outside or economically, buying power and beauty. We're looking at people and we go like, mm, 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 and we compare them as though they some product, some car as you buy online. <laughs> and you say, if that is your assumption with which you want to go into marriage, it's not a good one because the outside really doesn't matter that much. Am I saying there's nothing to sexual appeal? I'm saying there is something to sexual appeal. It is good. But let's be honest, you know, after three kids... And 10 years of marriage, 15 years of marriage, none of you might look as prime specimen anymore. But marriage is way more than the outside. If that is the assumption that you go into, it's really dangerous. It's really dangerous. Let me just say something. 
for those of you who wait for words or receive words, as a pastor, I hear lots of these conversations. And I was a pastor on a campus in Pretoria and Tigerberg, and now I'm pastoring a church in Durbanville. I've heard so many people who have words from God or signs from God for someone. I have not heard, listen to me, I have not heard one person who had a word for the, the non-model in church. <laughs> people have words for beautiful people. People have words for beautiful people. People receive a word from God for that one which is on the band and he can sing. But every time he strums the guitar, his biceps are really beautiful. Or, or this one. And you're laughing. I'm going to say, just evaluate your words. Just evaluate who we are. We want to say God says, but meanwhile, you're just looking at beautiful people. And that's what we're doing with the consumerist thing. We, we look at, we want outside beauty. We long outside beauty. God says, listen, I'm, and I want to tell you, happy marriage. There's something about that song, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life. Okay? <laughs> There's something, something about that song which might, be, might lead you in the right direction. Outside beauty, short, does not bring joy. It does not bring lasting joy. That's a consumer side. The gamble side, you know what I mean with the gamble? I'll hang with you for a while, even in the relationship, even while I'm dating you. Some people, even while I'm marrying you, even while I'm married to you, I go like, hmm, you, 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 you give me a lot, man. Your, your pro list is good. Your, your negative side is not that good. And then someone else comes along and you compare notes and he goes like this, and I'm going to trade this card for that card. We laugh. This is what we do. This is what our culture does. I'll trade you. And I'm going to say you will not find joy and you will not find companionship or fulfillment in any relationship with a mindset that, with that, with a mindset like that. Do I say you shouldn't date? I'm like, no, no, I mean, please take people for coffee. Please take them for coffee. Please take them for cake. Please take them for steaks. Please take them for dances. Please take anywhere. Get to know people. Get to know people. Get to know. But don't do this. I'm comparing you, and I'm like, hey, yes, yes, Oleg. Yes, Oleg Garcino. <laughs> <laughs> See you on the other side. Don't do this. Don't do the gambling thing. Because what I'm saying is, you don't know when that ball is going to stop rolling. And I don't mean death. I don't mean death. I mean, you might land on a number that is single because you're dumb and you've been spinning the wheel and you've been looking at everything else. I want to say that marriage, love is not found somewhere. Love is not found in finding the right person. We grow in love and that's what the Bible says over and over and over again. We grow in love. We grow in love. In Christians, but you don't have to be Christian to have this. We grow in love. We grow in love all together. Love is something that grows as I just do good whatever good demands to you. That, that's publicly. Great. So let's, <laughs> I just didn't want to put this up there, and I'm not going to say too much about that. Wait. God will send him my way. God will send him my way. I'm going to wait in my room. God will send. If, if God wants me to marry, then I'll, I want to tell you, God, God gave a word to my wife that she's going to marry. And we married here, not because she hid. God gave a word to my wife that she, she'll be a pediatrician one day. It doesn't happen by waiting. Nothing in life happens by passively waiting. You know, God's going to beam him up somewhere like he did Philip and then beam him down into my room, and it's a sign there'll be angels, two rainbows, and a flower. <laughs> and I'll know that this is the one. You can see that I've been around Christian circles for a while now. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to say, let's keep this, all you need is love and nonsense. We know that we're looking for character and purpose in relationships. You're looking for someone trustworthy. That's all I'm going to say. Faith, hope, and love. We're looking for someone trustworthy. We're looking for someone dependable. We're looking for someone humble. We oh, you, you think, think beyond the happy honeymoon vibes. What type of person do you need to be to make someone happy in marriage? I want to say, not just beautiful. So minimize your time in the gym. 
maximize your time in character development elsewhere. Gymming is good for character development, endurance, faithfulness, steadfastness, you know, you can do that, but we have to, learn. so let me just, so, but you know, I'm not going to speak about this one, because I want to get to the scripture. So, Malachi chapter 2, Malachi, the last book in the Bible, <sighs> listen, so much is written on marriage in the Bible, but I think, I think if there's only one text that you can memorize when it comes to marriage, what God says about marriage, then this is a good one for you who are married and for you who are single, because this is what we, this is the mindset that leads to a happy, fulfilled marriage, the mindset, the, the expectations in it. First of all, so God is having a conversation with religious people like us at the end of the first cent, uh, end of the Old Testament, 400 years before Christ, 430 years before Christ, and Malahachi, he was an Italian prophet. So Malahachi is speaking to the people and he's saying, he's saying, guys, 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 you come to me and I, I see so many divorces and I see so many nonsense in your, in, in your, among you people, your religious bunch, so much nonsense happening here. Let me just remind you what marriage is all about. God says, you're praying to me, but let me be honest, I'm not listening to you at all. And this is the reason, because of what you've made about marriage. You want to do all this worship and bring me cows and bulls and bow down and do all your tithing and stuff. God says, I'm not interested. Get this thing right. This is primary. This is human nature. This, this, this reveals me. And then he says, why is God not listening to our prayers, the whole nation? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth. Why do, would you say wife of your youth? Take 10 seconds there to think. Because after that, they might have had a few. They've been trading, upgrading, wife 3.5, anyway. So they've been doing that. He's saying between the wife of your youth. And then he talks to them saying, to whom you have been faithless. Though she is, and listen to how he defines, defines marriage. First of all, he defines marriage like he did in Genesis, companion, help meet, person who walks the road with me, friend, someone who moves with me for the rest of my life, companion, someone who is with me so that I will never feel alone, someone where two is better than one because you have a greater reward, two is better than one because you sleep warm at night, two is better than one, you have, you have strength and character, two is better than one. God says companion. First of all, that's what we look for when you look, you look for a friend. You look for someone to share life with. You look for someone who sort of in the conversation when they talk to you and you sort of, you think this person gets you. This person gets how you feel. You, you feel, sort of feel, I can share, I can be myself around you. That takes a while. That really takes a while. It take, takes a while. But someone like that, friendship, you're looking for that person. She was your companion. And God says that was the original intent of marriage, companionship so that you will not feel alone. I'm just saying this, please, there's grace here. But for those of you, and many of you coming up from this church like myself, have a call in ministry. And you think, although you're gonna do something professional, that you're gonna do ministry or mission somewhere. Don't look for a missionary guy or girl, because that's not the scope of marriage. The scope of marriage is companionship. Don't look for someone who has the same prophecies in their life as you. I'm going to say that because I was dumb in that way. There's only one requirement, and anything added to that, I'm going to say you're moving beyond the scope of what marriage is. Companionship. Someone who will walk the road with you. That's it. The next one, he says, is companion. How was she companion? By, so the intent of marriage is companionship. The means of marriage or the mode of marriage, the, the, what effectuate marriage is, he says, covenant. It's, it, I know 50 people will say that a covenant is not a contract and a contract is not a covenant. I'm going to say, biblically speaking, there's so much agreement between the two. It just means it's a legally binding thing that you do in front of people, a vow to God in front of everyone. The nature of marriage is a promise. I will stick with you. That's why I'm saying marriage is defined as a covenant of companionship, a promise, a legally binding promise that says, you will never feel alone for the rest of your life. So help me God, everyone sees me, I will not make this woman feel alone again. I will stick with her. And that is the nature of what 
why marriage is so blessed. Even secularly people say that. Why it's so blessed. It's the most secure place you can find on earth. Because it means someone, you will feel safe with someone, not based on their emotions, but based on a pre-decision that they said, doesn't matter what's happening here, I'll stand by you. I'll stand by you. And they all sing it to one another and it's amazing. But it's a sticking to one another. It's a promise that is legally binding. It, it, it means that you are safe now and forever, regardless what we go through. I want to tell you, I will be your friend. I'll be your friend. I'll not deny you. I'll be faithful to you. It's going to hurt, but I'll stick with you. This is the reason why sometimes you only get to know the person after the marriage and not before the marriage, really. I want to really just say this out there. You will always discover, discover stuff about your spouse after marriage. Some of the married people will just go, yeah. You throw food, you throw and you throw not throw, isn't yourself? And the reason is this, manoki. The reason is this, because before the marriage, we have a consumer relationship, you know, in a sense. It's like, I, I have to, you know, it's like coming to a supermarket. The supermarket has to always impress me. Otherwise, I'll just go to another supermarket, in a sense, you know. It's like, if, if this is really bad, then I'll just move on. But after marriage, if we have a partnership, if we have a supply chain, huh? <laughs> supply chain relationship, then I'm going to fix the supply chain because this is not right. But before that, I'll just find a cheaper guy that gives me the same products at the same price elsewhere, you know, quicker. But once we're married, this is a shaping relationship where the two of us are being shaped. It's a covenant. It's a promise before God and before people. And the purpose of everyone around me is to hold me to that promise. The essence of marriage is covenant. Guys, girls, if you're looking for a date or someone to have fun with, you know, it's fine if you're 18. But if you're 30 years old and you're just looking for a date or something, I want to say recalibrate. Just, just readjust your expectations. There's something wrong. You need someone who will stick with you forever because only there you will be fully known and can be fully yourself in the place of absolute vulnerability because the promise says, I'll stick with you. And then you can say, listen, this is me. Will you love me anyway, although I'm grumpy like this? And she goes, I have to. I made the promise to God. Okay. <laughs> Covenant. The God's part in marriage. I want to look, look at that. God says, I'm the one who makes you one. How? God says, when you make a promise to one another before me, God says, I'm jumping in here. I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to pour a portion of my spirit. I'm going to pour myself into your marriage. I'm going to make you one. Something mysterious happened here. I'm going to merge the two of you. That's why after many years of marriage, you look like your spouse. I chose a good wife for that one. Ek gaan nog nekies like vir rikkie in my leven. Grappi. But there's something, I'm joking now, but you'll see all the people look like one another. But there's something, there's something mystical here. There's something mystical about marriage. He who finds a wife finds favor from God. There's something about God pouring himself into your marriage. Two is better than one, but a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. God pours himself into a marriage. God makes us one. There's something mystical. And the reason why he says, don't get divorced, is this thing. He says, don't get divorced. Why? Because, because of this, you're going to do violence. I make you one. And when you get out, there's going to be, the Bible says there, a tearing in your spirit. There's going to be a ripping apart, which, which has which is very, very painful and very real consequences. Let me tell you this. If you're not motivated to get married because, you know, of where you come from, um, maybe some stuff that you've experienced in the past, let me encourage you with this. Statistically speaking, you can, any sociology report, you can go anywhere. <laughs> people who are married are more prosperous than people who are not. You just, so I'm not going to, People who are married have less chance of heart disease, infectious diseases, blood pressure issues. In any, you can go in all of those diseases. Lower risk. And we're going to like, wow, how on earth is that possible? Something about God pouring himself in marriage which is blessed. It's a, he who finds a wife finds a good thing because there God pours out his favor, the Bible says. He who finds a wife finds a good thing, you'll receive favor. You'll receive favor. There's something about the goodness of God. The chance of promotion, promotion, one of the studies in the U.S. shows 
chances of promotion is much bigger just because you find someone. <laughs> anyway, there's so much more. But this is something about God pouring himself in there. I'm finishing. What does God want from marriage? And this is part of the definition of marriage. I once did a, a marriage, um, a wedding seminary, seminary, ceremony. Anyway, I did not Anyway, I went to a <laughs> Once did a wedding ceremony with a, uh, with a very saved Catholic priest. And the man stood up and he did the formula. I did the preaching. And the formula he preached, if they don't conclude the marriage until you promise this, will you receive children from this marriage as a gift from God? And then you say, yes. And then he says, now I declare you husband and wife. <laughs> Before that, he doesn't. Because essentially, the nature of what does God want from marriage, well, in essence, less than the two of you being happy. More than the two of you being happy. I want more. I want, I want, I want to bless you because I want to bless people in you and through your union. You know, there's something, and it has children, but it has to do with influence in the world. God says, your marriage is bigger than you. Your marriage is not just the two of you finding happiness in one another. Marriage is about the blessing of God to people. God says, I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing. And then the essence of marriage in terms of what is the key to marriage, well, just be faithful in heart, intent, in motion. To what? To the promise that you make, that I will never make you feel alone. This morning now, this is a beautiful definition of marriage. Companionship, covenant, children, faithfulness. It's really beautiful. You were laughing more when I did the other stuff. I'll just get back to that then. Let me close with this one thought. Let me close with this one thought. And please, guys, this, this needs wisdom. So it needs wisdom. It means you need godly counsel of married people around you. But I find so many people who quickly write of good friendships that from this slightly older man's perspective... Not, not very old, 40, but I've been around this block for a while. I'm looking at people who, <laughs> who date one another, and they look, and then they end a relationship because of one or two things, and I'm like, you know what? She'll make an excellent wife, like excellent. I can see this. And he'll make a really good husband. But they write one another off because of petty things. Look at that text. Next one. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. But by the strength of an ox, a big harvest is brought in. And you go like, what? It's a proverb. So without an ox, there's no poo in the stables, for those of you who don't come from a farming background. But there is no, there isn't strength either. Everything is in order. Everything is clean. It's nice to be by myself. It's nice to have my own way. It's nice to do whatever I want to. But with the ox, there's promise of a massive harvest. There's promise of a massive produce, massive increase, great productivity. And that's just what I want to close with you guys. Every relationship brings stuff, brings yourself to the front, brings other people's issues to the front. Every single relationship comes that way. Every single relationship. But the issue, love is exactly that thing which forgives is kind regardless of what you do, has compassion for the other one, is meekness, give deference to the other one, puts up the other one more. Love is exactly that thing which does good regardless of what it comes from and forgives and helps us shape. It's a place of shaping us into holiness. And marriage is that place from God. And I want to encourage you guys, in your friendships, don't be too quick to write the other one off because of stuff. Because I'm going to tell you, I would have been single if my wife did this, if Mahrit did this. I wasn't perfect. I wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect yet. She's, she's quite close to it, but I'm not yet. And she's really a much better person than me in many ways. But I want to just encourage you guys. With any ox comes maintenance. With anything that comes in your life, there is work. But the reward is so much, so much better. My design, my prayer for you guys, I see some of you are married and you're smiling because you, you, know, you don't have to go through all of this again. But the rest of you, my heart's desire, my prayer for you is that the bells, the wedding bells like the one prophet writes in Zechariah, that again in Stellenbosch, that again in Jerusalem, 
the, the wedding bells will resound and there will be joy in the streets because of the marriages that is coming out. My desire is that you'll find a spouse and you'll find a spouse quickly. My desire is that good friendships will be formed and you'll grow how to behave in kindness and godliness until the point that you're married. My desire is that you will, that you will be examples of godliness in marriage in a culture where marriage isn't regarded anymore. My desire is that there will be joy and goodness, that your homes will be filled with all the peace and all the friendships that God sends your way so that you can be lighthouses and examples for godliness in marriage. And my desire is that, like I do, you get to know God and God so, God's relationship with us so much more once you're married because then you understand this is what you talk about when you say that you're so committed to me regardless of my imperfection. I get to know God because of my married life. And my prayer is that you'll have the same. And that you don't have to wait until you're 40 for that. But you'll get married to the wife of your youth and stay married to the wife of your youth. Amen. Amen.